falling asleep, I asked, oh, oh, we're recording. So one night as I was falling asleep, I asked myself, um, okay, what, how, what's the answer? How do I, how do I get out of this? You know, because I really did kind of feel like it was really hard for me to do at the time. And um, when I woke up in the morning, I, I don't remember the details of my dream, but I remember the answer to the question. And the answer to the question was, um, make a different choice. And, and it wasn't the answer that was important. It was the feeling behind the answer. And the feeling was this feeling of um, deep compassion and love. And that, um, you know, there's, I guess it was my inner self that was answering this or whatever, but it was like all of the confidence in the world that I could make a different choice. I could make it, you know, choice towards um, a wise choice or whatever. Um, and I, I kind of feel like this section on contrition is like that inner voice that is, you know, that I had in my dream. And it's telling us that, that we, you know, we can choose a different choice. We can choose wisdom. We can choose to follow this roadmap of the precepts. Um, and it's telling us very compassionately, you know, that we can do this. And, and it's telling us to open our hearts and let these words guide you um, on your path. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I think it's about. And um, going back to the past <laughs> section, I think uh, I, I, that's kind of basically what, what, what my message is on this. And it's kind of short, um, but I'm really interested in what you guys have to say about contrition as well, because I think um, everybody has something interesting to to teach about this you know and so i'd like to open it up for discussion but um i have like a discussion question i could throw out there um so i'll do that and then um after a couple minutes we can come back and I have, i'd like to end this with a quote so if somebody could just sort of keep time and once we get towards the end of my 20 minutes or whatever just um, let me know so I can sort of wrap it up. But um, going back to the, the little bit about the posture, um, again, I'll quote it again, we should sit up straight in the presence of the Buddha and make this act of contrition wholeheartedly. Um, I'm going to ask you a really great question that Joshin asked me. What does it mean to sit up straight when you are facing the suffering of your karma? Um, so what do you think? I'd like to open it up for a discussion. And just unmute yourself if you would like to talk. <laughs> I don't think I have that power. I love that line. I love the idea that you sit up straight while you're recognizing that you're an imperfect human being. Um, it feels like, it feels like recognizing that you still have self-worth, that you still have value, even though you're imperfect. I don't know. Yeah. For me, I think, what is the alternative? Should we bow in the presence of Buddha? Should we cower should we beg no wait, sit up straight yeah. that's pretty powerful i love the idea of um compassion with the contrition that um we don't have to beat we whether we beat ourselves or not the the essence that which is is not beating us that it is uh, accepting us with compassion and um that makes contrition 
so much easier. You know, if I know I'm going to be punished for it, the hell with it. But when I can do it with knowing that I'm going, to, it's going to be received con with compassion is beautiful. I mean, it just, it all flows together. So, thank you. I also feel like there's a bit of logic in there too. It's saying, you know, karmic consequence is inevitable. It's, it's, you're going to deal with the consequences of your actions, um, but you don't have to. Um, I like the word that, uh, uh, that you used Dixie. Uh, you don't have to grovel or um, you don't have to shrink. You can, mm -hmm be there wholeheartedly in the face of your karmic consequence. Mani, thank you for the, uh, to, the literal um, sitting up straight, that just the posture as aspect, that's just so great. Um, and sitting up straight, you know, the verse says, uh, you know, all my past and harmful karma, born of beginningless greed, hate, and delusion through body, speech, and mind, I now fully avow. And so to avow, I've, you know, when I first heard the verse, I looked it up because I, I never heard the word before. And um, this was, you know, a lot of years ago. And um, it's really a great word, and, and it means to just own up to, you know. It, mm -hmm. And I've heard that I've heard the contrition verse um, translated otherwise um, elsewhere as atone, with which to me has an entirely different meaning. So, so this isn't like I'm not apologizing, you know. I'm just, I'm just owning this, mm -hmm. sitting up straight and owning it. And I think that's so powerful. Yeah, like you're just kind of showing up, you know. And when 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 Joshin first asked me this question, my first instinct was, oh my gosh, I I would. It's scary the idea of sitting up straight in the face of your suffering and your karma is kind of scary. Like, it it just, wow, you know. <laughs> but so like I think sitting sitting up straight in the face of your suffering has you know it's kind of brave you know and and um so you got to kind of pat yourself on the back a little bit for that again you know like, like you know uh, and, but also realize too that you have you have and and it says this also in that verse the or the the section that you have all of your the ancestors and the buddhas behind you backing you up so you know you have you have everybody you you got you got all kinds of just just what I was thinking. I I looked uh, in. You're sitting in the presence of the Buddhas. You're not sitting in front of a judge. Mm -hmm. Like they're there with you to help you, yeah. guide you. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what everybody else said about sitting upright, um, and. Um, the other element that comes to mind for me is just dignity, I guess, is like, that's a way of acknowledging the consequences of how we've thought and behaved in the past in a dignified manner. And like, as adults, as opposed to like, the <laughs> that Christian model is children who are being punished by a parental force, you know, outside of us. So and then the compassion that y'all were talking about comes in there too. <laughs> so that to me is, you know, as opposed to the, the alternatives of, of cowering or, or bowing your head down, it's, it's being upright because there's no one out there punishing us. It's, it just comes from what we ourselves have done. So, but I, yeah, thank you for bringing up the, just the posture idea. Love that.
about three more minutes, Moni. Okay, so um, anybody else have anything they want to say about that? I'll wrap it up um, with a quote. And um, I really love what you guys said. So thank you very much for your comments. And I, I really appreciate it. Um, I love, I love, um, I love that you guys were sort of uh, latched on. I guess I kind of latched onto the compassion idea too, but, but the ending quote, um, because as I was thinking about this, I, I sort of thought about it as the choice because that's how my dream was, you know, like it was like this choice. You can choose, you can, in every moment you have a choice, you can choose love or you can choose hate, which is kind of like black and white. So there's obviously more shades in between, but, um, but the idea is to choose, like just choose point in the direction of the precepts, I guess. And so I have a quote from the Dalai Lama that kind of popped up as I was sort of thinking about all this stuff that I thought was kind of interesting that I thought I would share. So I'll leave, I'll end with this quote. And it says, um, sadly, many of the things that undermine our joy and happiness, we create ourselves. Often it comes from the negative tendencies of the mind or from our inability to appreciate and utilize the resources that exist within us. Suffering from a natural disaster we cannot control, but the suffering from our daily disasters we can. We create most of our suffering, so it's logical that we also have the ability to create more joy. It simply depends on the attitudes, the perspectives, and the reactions we bring to situations and to our relationships with other people. When it comes to personal happiness, there's a lot that we as individuals can do. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. And um, I look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say about the precepts. Thank you, Amani. Dixie, are you ready? I'm good. Well, I got the three pure precepts. Uh, I actually have an outline to go from. <laughs> That probably sounds daunting. When I think of the three pure precepts, I think of my own struggle with coming towards them. The way I came towards this path was having been totally tied up in Christian morals and guilt and being unable to untangle myself from the illogics I'd gotten myself into. But when I finally started to untangle it, the first thing that came to me was the three pure precepts that what was needed was a framework to have actions to take that once you had Contrition. Once you and I had plenty of contrition. Once you had contrition, you needed support, and then you needed to know what to do. Because it's the bit about acknowledging karma and acknowledging your mistakes. To me, says this is what happened, but I'm not going to go forward with it. I'm not going to take any of this bad mistakes or lessons I learned from Ford, I'm going to do these things instead. And that's where the pure, three pure precepts start with me. And I had questions as I go, so I don't know how that works. But the first thing that comes to me is what makes these precepts pure? How are they different from the grave precepts? Why are these three set aside? And I have my own ideas about that. My personal idea is that they're pure because we can't go against them. There's not anything about them that you can fail. You can not do them or not do them, but there's no go this far. What do I not kill? What do I not steal? How much do I take? What, what is, you no, know, pure, pure precepts are just that pure. And to start with the first one, cease from evil, release all self-attachment. This is the house of all the ways of Buddha. This is the source of all the laws of Buddhahood. 
when it comes to that one, uh, questions that race that would come to my mind is, what is self-attachment? Is self-attachment the true evil? Is holding our karma, holding our mistakes, and then going forward to that with those and interacting with the world, is that a true cause of suffering? Not ours, only ours, but everyone else's. As Moni put it, our choices. Well, we can choose to take our karma forward or we can choose to acknowledge it and let it go. Is in that case, does contrition releasing self-attachment? Is that what why we're doing contrition? Is that to let go, to allow us to cease from evil? And in the same sense that when we take contrition, we um, acknowledge the three greed, hatred, and delusion, which are the three poisons. So is ceasing from evil thus acknowledging the work of the three poisons and allowing immaculacy, which is the result of contrition, to guide our actions instead? And then do only good, take selfless action. The Dharma of the Samyak Sambodhi is the dharma of all existence, never apart from the present moment. One of the questions I had about this one was, what is the Anirtara Samyak Sambodhi? And I looked that up. It's, as it says, complete perfect enlightenment, the, the perfect enlightenment that the Buddha came, toward, came, came into and the enlightenment that all bod, bod, bodhisattvas strive for. But that's pretty much all it's defined as, unless you get really, really into it, in which case you find out that the only way you can learn what the Anatora Sambak Sambodhi is and get it for yourself is to study the Flower Ornament Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, which is apparently 39 chapters and about 2,600 pages or so. <laughs> And when I taught, I, when I spoke with Joshin about this talk, we had a little conversation and she had asked me to write down this, that um, what we, we talked about is how can you, how can you strive towards something you don't know where it is? Because we don't know much about how to get to Samyak, somebody, we have instructions, but <laughs> it's gonna take a long time to read them. And I don't know that it, we, most of us are going to. But what I said was sometimes your aim is more true when you don't know what you're aiming at. So I leave that with you. And then finally, do good for others. Embrace all things and conditions. Leap beyond the unholy and the holy and the unholy. Let us rescue ourselves together with all beings. For me, what struck me most about this and the reason I liked Zen so much was that bit about let us rescue ourselves together with all beings. One of the things that got me stuck when I was still a Christian was that there are indeed two true precepts, um, love God and love your neighbor. But loving yourself is never mentioned. And how important that is that releasing, that releasing one's own suffering and relieving one's own suffering is to me probably the most important bit about being able to do good for others because do unto others as you would have them do unto you, a basic Christian principle, works better when you don't hate yourself. Let's see, I hate myself. I'm going to uh, cut my wrist. I'll cut your wrists too. It, the logic, I don't know how the logic sounds there, but basically if you hate yourself, it's very hard to be good to anyone else. And then what is meant by holy and unholy, that holy and unholy aren't concepts we discuss much in Zen. They're very Christian concepts in a way. But if you replace them with good and bad or skillful and unskillful, does that change what good is? What is doing good for others if it's skillful versus unskillful? How do we embrace all things and conditions? How do we embrace the unlovely and evil without taking part in them, without approving of them? And that's where I'm going to leave you with all the questions and none of the answers.
but you know, if you guys want to talk or ask questions, I'm I'm good with that. I should say. <laughs> Dixie, would you mind repeating what your first question was? Oh, you're muted. I can't hear you. Oops. For the first pre-step or the last one? No, the, there's a question you asked toward the beginning. What makes the precepts pure? How are they yeah. different from the grave precepts? But I just it made me th I I have no idea I have no answers I just I had never thought of the distinction between the the words pure and grave so thank you for giving me something to contemplate I think um, when you were talking about doing good for others and how you can't do good for others um, unless you love yourself and then kind of taking it back to the cease from evil and release all self-attachment. And I think about how much of what we think of as self-care or you know popular culture self-care at least really has nothing to do with self-care and has a lot to do with like consumerism and it's not necessarily about letting go of um actually the things that are harming you you know going out and drinking a whole bunch some people think that that's self-care but that's not that's not help that's not helpful to you and similarly with um, allowing your ego to kind of rule your decision-making, that, um, that kind of ties back into that whole, whole concept. I don't, so at least that's kind of, that's what I was thinking when, when you were talking about that stuff. Things similarly, that's kind of what I was trying to get at is they all hang together and that the contrition we're looking for is what enables us to do this. There's an element here too that self-love, we have to be careful of ego. Uh, so there's a balancing act there um, of how do we love ourselves and get rid of self-attachment um, at the same time, how do we love ourselves and get rid of ego? I mean, I know it's possible and I, I think I have some answers on that, but it's a question that I think is one of the major things of growing up of how do you learn to, to be detached from your ego and, um, and love yourself at the same time. I mean, it, it's a, it's one of the major questions of, humanity, I think. It's a great question. It's one that's gotten me tripped up a lot in the past because being someone who's naturally self-hatred, getting rid of ego means denigrating the self. And that is not helpful. And one of the reasons I came to my approach to this is that self-attachment in this case is not ego. It's letting go of your past mistakes, letting go of your past successes, letting go of your expectations. That is self-attachment. That is holding on to what makes you, you. But if you let go of that, all you, you don't longer have the you, you. So in a way that's ego, in a way that's not. I don't know, that's, I, I like that. It feels like a more healthy way to look at it to me, for me, not necessarily for the rest of you, you probably have much healthier egos than I do. <laughs> well, are we really striving to get rid of our ego or, or just to see th through it as empty? Because, you know, it has its 
useful moments, I guess. Stops you from stepping out in front of a truck or off the off a cliff, you know. I really liked what you the connection that you drew between contrition and I think you and Bonnie both talked about choice and um, how you can't you can't release you can't cease from evil and release all self attachment you know if you uh, if you don't understand it what your karma is you know so so if you if you can't avow your your karma um, because you haven't paid attention to what you're doing um, you don't have a choice really anymore. You're just a robot responding, responding to your karmic habit energy. So I, I'd like to thank you for kind of tying that together. Also, you talked about um, leaping beyond the holy and the unholy, which is just such I, one of my super favorite lines. And I, th I see it as um, leaving, leaving judgment behind. Thank you. That was you had a lot of densely packed questions in there. So those were that was uh, the only ones I remembered. But you had some other good ones too. Dixie, would you repeat what you said about um, not needing to know where you're going to orient towards it? Was that what you had said? Well, sometimes your aim is more true when you don't know what you're aiming at. Yes, yes, yes. I just wanted to hear that one more time. Like, when you said that, my whole, like, everything in my core just said yes. So that was a, that was a good thing to hear there. Thank you for sh sharing that part. It I, I was just at a Dharma thing on Saturday and someone brought up the Sh Shunru Suzuki. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right. The one who started the San Francisco Zen Center. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. That's what came to my mind when you were saying, maybe it's a good thing to not know exactly what you're aiming for. I like that idea of many possibilities. And I'd like to add one final story to go with Moni's dream, my own dream about choice. I dreamed that I was late to catch a bus and that I finally got on board the bus and I was Oh, my day is ruined. Everything is ruined. My life is over. And the dreamer just said, wait a minute. What if, what if I just take this as a new start? And I went on and I was happy and everything went well. And it just reminded me of Moni's story. Choice. We can enhance or slay ourselves with our thoughts. I like that, Jean. Um, it, it, it goes with the um, embrace all things and conditions. You know, just, yeah, I like that. That's good. That was great. Yeah, yeah I like that. When I first, um, we first started reading this particular translation of the pure precepts, I think there's another translation that doesn't use the word evil. I think it says cease from harm or something like that. 
Um, but for some reason, the word evil, I really, I, I like it. I don't know why, but I just, it, it kind of helps me for some reason. And I don't, I, I, I don't know why, like it just, I think it's because the, the word evil has a lot of, um, it also has a lot of baggage for me because I, I used to go to a Pentecostal church and I, I think there's some trauma from that, you know, past trauma or something. And, um, so there's something about the word evil and the, and cease from evil that just kind of like helps me a little bit. Um, I don't know. Anyway, it's just, that's something that always kind of has caught me whenever I read that. That's a whole nother dissertation. What is evil? I like the fact that they define it as self-attachment, but when you look at it as a people, what is doing good? What is what is doing evil? And that's a very, a question with a lot of answers, and very meaty one to dig into. That's I right. Think, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I think the word evil itself, the word is evil. I mean, the sound of it is just for, on some level. It's always kind of gripped me, but um, your phrasing tonight, Dixie, your uh, unfolding of your questions right from the beginning, talking about the framework of Soto Zen, our practice, just uh, made things so clear, and then the wisdom that followed the comments. And I think it was perfect that, Dixie, your um, talk followed Mani's because contrition is, I feel, uh, self-care and not in the uh, monetary sense, but just honoring this body, this life we have and taking care of ourselves. And... Um, Ego uh, can be the small self, which I like to use instead of ego, because there's a part of ego that's good. We teach children not to play with matches or play in the traffic. So that's a different ego. That's an ego that's just a healthy human being. But um, so thanks for the images and the vocabulary that you uh, shine the light on tonight, both of you. Thank you, Ruth Ann, and thank you all for listening and, and, and questioning and commenting. Well, Dixie, I love your your kind of off the cuff question. What is good? It's more interesting question than what is evil, really. I think. So that would be a whole whole other conversation. And and I I get why Bonnie says she likes the uh, cease from evil. It kind of like isn't wishy washy. It's just like quit it. You know what I mean? It was bad. Don't do it. So so there's there's some sort of clean clarity about that, even though certainly it's a loaded word and could be discussed forever. On the other hand, just stop doing evil. We all know kind of what it means, but but doing good is, uh, that's, that'd be, an, that'd be an interesting conversation. Thanks for bringing that up. It's my conclusion after practicing that doing good for oneself is doing good. Any last questions or comments before we wrap things up? I have a quick one and it's, um, I think it's just my, I think what I'm gonna part with tonight is the um, 
constriction I felt when people were talking about not having an aim, a plan gives you more possibilities. Um, I could feel my whole body react like from a planner <laughs> that has to have everything mapped out on calendars and charts and apps and it, I could just feel my body just go, wait a minute, I know there's that part of me that goes, okay, I know this is right. But <laughs> that's what I'll be sitting with tonight with, as we close. <gasps> How much that, um, I think just opening it up and just, I mean, that, that part of just knowing there's a ton of possibilities if I, if I wouldn't plan just going this direction. But boy, to break that is really, I don't know, something to sit with. Thank you. I appreciate your transparency there, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight we had um, our first two Sangha members coming forward to present um, and facilitate discussions around contrition and the three pure precepts. Next week, we will have um, Dixie bringing forward Do Not Kill, Cultivate and Encourage Life. And we will have Joe Rin here bringing forward Do Not Steal, Honor the Gift Not Yet Given. I think it's been a while since we've had Joe Rin with us on a Wednesday night, so it'll be good to, to see him. And with that, I just want to close and say thank you all for um, bringing forward your understanding of these precepts. And also thank you for those who asked questions and offered comments, because this is what brings this sort of thing alive, is this engagement between, between people and offering up um, thoughts and ideas and questions. It's a little harder over Zoom, but I'm glad we're doing this. Uh, please make gasho. Abiding in this ephemeral world like a lotus in muddy water, the mind is pure and goes beyond. Thus we bow to Buddha. All Buddhas throughout space and time, all honored ones, bodhisattvas, mahasattvas, wisdom beyond wisdom, maha, prajna, paramita. Good job, y'all. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.